Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, have you ever, have you ever come to like a place like in like maybe a book that you're reading or maybe a movie that you're watching or a TV show that you're watching where it would seem like, like the author just kind of like in quick succession just kind of throws a bunch of random stuff at you to kind of move the plot story along? Yeah, like maybe, maybe they've taken like quite a bit of time to develop like a character that you're reading about or watching, or, or maybe they've given you like a fill-in of like some good backstory, and then it's almost like the author, it dawned on them like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be telling a story too, so here, this, 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 and this happened really, really quick in there, and that kind of moves us to the next big thing I want to talk to you about. Have you ever noticed that that happens every now and then? And I don't know about you, but, but when those things happen, I, I got to admit, it kind of it like, it bothers me, it annoys me a little bit, because I'm like, couldn't you have give me a, given me a little more detail about the this, this, this that happened? Couldn't you have maybe did a little better with some pacing here so that it, it sort of flowed a little better? I, I just get a little bit irritated at those moments. And I got to admit that that's kind of what the gospel reading today felt like to me. It kind of irritated me, so I knew I had to preach on it. Is Mark just kind of like dawning on him that, oh yeah, he's got to move the story along, so he kind of just throws a bunch of random things at us all at once? I mean, that's kind of what it felt like, at least at first blush. You know, I mean, I, what's he say? He says, oh, so like Jesus and his buddies, they leave church. They go out of the synagogue. And Peter says, hey, why don't you come over to my place for dinner? Okay, we'll come over. So when they come over, what do they find? They find Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And so they say, well, should we tell Jesus? Yeah, let's tell Jesus. So they told Jesus. And Jesus goes and he heals her. And then she begins to practice hospitality and care for them. And then what happens? Well, the sun goes down. Everybody shows up at the door. There's a bunch of weird people there that need healing and whatnot. Jesus heals them. And then in the middle of the night, while everybody else is sacked out, Jesus gets up, he goes somewhere to pray. When everyone wakes up, they go, wow, where's Jesus? And they go, well, let's go looking for him. Peter finds him and says, hey, everyone's looking for you. And he says, great, let's go somewhere else. I'll go preaching around Galilee. And so he does. There, we move the story along, haven't we? And I think to myself, is that really, is that it? Is that all that Mark is doing? Is this merely some random list of stuff that, that has no rhyme or reason together? It's just sort of Mark just kind of moving the plot along and, and just kind of pushing us to get us to the cross. So he's got to do some filler until we get to the good stuff. Or is there something more? Is there something that our Lord would give us in these verses that go a little bit deeper for the followers of Jesus even today. And so today, let's tap the brakes a little bit. And let's slow that seemingly random list of stuff down. And take a look at what our Lord gives us in these verses. It had already been a long day. Jesus had been teaching at the synagogue. He had been proclaiming God's word to God's people. His disciples were there as well. And at the end of services, Peter does practice hospitality. He invites Jesus and fellow followers to his home. When they come to his home to receive that hospitality, they find that a family member is sick. Peter's mother-in-law has a fever. In fact, Luke tells us that they can distinguish between a mild fever and a severe fever. Luke tells us that it is a high fever. She's in physical jeopardy. And now there probably is a point of wondering for the disciples are the miracles that Jesus did because when he was at the temple or when, at, when he was at the synagogue and he was teaching that Sabbath, there arrived this person who was possessed by a demon. Could you imagine someone possessed by a demon walking into faith one morning for church? No, pastor uh, says, no, let's not do that. You know, uh, I mean, the sounds that would have been there, the disruption that would have been there. Now Jesus calls out in the spirit, the demon, he knows who it is. And he says that he's the Holy One of, of God. And Jesus silences that demon. Why? Because faith 
comes by hearing by the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Spirit gets to say who Jesus is. No one will be a follower of Jesus based on the proclamation of a demon, even if the demon is speaking the truth. So Jesus will silence the forces of evil because they have nothing to do with faith. So as he silences this demon, he casts him out. The crowd is stirred. They say, what is this teaching and with authority? Teaching with authority from God's word, teaching with authority by deeds that reflect it. And now the disciples back at home probably wonder, are those miracles merely for show? Are they merely there to stir the crowd up? Or will those blessings come for the followers of Jesus as well? And of course, how does Jesus respond? Well, he responds with compassion. One of his creatures is in need. And notice how intimately he responds, that he will reach out and touch this person. He's not afraid of the disease or the virus that she has. He is the agent of life. He's the agent of cleansing. He heals her, and she now gets to practice hospitality as well. But it affords us the opportunity to even wonder, what exactly is the point of any physical healing in Jesus' ministry? I mean, if God comes along and he heals someone physically, whether it be a fever that goes away, or legs that can walk now, or eyes that can see now, well, that's nice. But boy, that's a kind of a hollow miracle at best if death, eternal death, and God's never-ending wrath still loom out there for all of humanity right? And so what? He did something nice for me for, that might last for 20, 30, 40 years. If I still have eternal condemnation waiting at the end, it was almost like it was a sick joke. That's not the point. Actually, quite the opposite. The point of Jesus' physical healings, every last one of them is a sign. It's a sign pointing toward a greater hope. It's a sign pointing toward the reality that God knows that we need that gift of life everlasting, that body that does not wear out, that, that humanity that we are that is not subjected to sin and death and everlasting condemnation. God knows that. And so Christ's healings are this sign now, a sign that God is coming into his world to do just that, to bring that gift of his healing that will not end. He's come to bring a reign of uh, the end of the reign of sin and death and everlasting wrath. And the miracles are a sign pointing to what needs to happen in order for the end of all of that to happen. God needs to proclaim his word among his people. Because as he proclaims his word, his word will be about his promises kept indeed. And so as he proclaims the word, it points to the reality that he will fulfill that word at the cross. You see, the miracles of healing are a sign that one day our Lord will resurrect our bodies because he's paid for them with his blood. You see, it does move us forward to the cross. But it tells us that Jesus has come to do more than just temporal blessings of compassion but he has come and done temporal blessings of compassion. But there's more to come. God bless you. And so notice how the next steps of that sign get fulfilled right then and there in the text. The folks probably who were at the synagogue watching Jesus cast out the demon, could you imagine the after worship, you know, the after worship meetings that were taking place in the parking lot? Did you see that? There's a guy out there with a demon. Jesus cast it right out. Oh, we've never seen anything like that. You know what? Wow, if he could do that, I wonder if he could help my aunt. I wonder if he could help my cousin. I wonder if he could help my friend who's really sick. Oh, but, but it's the Sabbath day. We can't go dragging our relatives over to Peter's house. That's going to be considered work. We'll get in trouble for that. Let's wait till sundown. With sundown... The Sabbath is officially over. And now notice what happens. The whole town shows up. They crowd into Peter's house, all the needy. Those who are sick, the ones who love them. 
the demon possessed come. I think that part makes us maybe a little uncomfortable in our modern day. I mean, really, people possessed by demons, we just don't feel like that's really a thing anymore. And yet there's signs of how the world is subject to evil and is hopeless without the one who's in that house. In fact, is our Lord drawing us through Mark to really see the world in a microcosm of Peter's house that day? A world that is suffering, a world that is sick, a world that is subject and enslaved to evil, and yet they crowd into that house. Why? Because there's one there who has come to do something about it. And he will. God incarnate is in that house. And he knows the need. Could you imagine his followers there with the smells of the sick and the growls of the demons? They see evil for what it is filling that house. And yet they see their rabbi, their Lord, is the one now who is the agent of cleansing, healing the sick in compassionate love, casting out the demons and again telling them to keep their mouth shut because they have no business trying to muddle or proclaim the message of the gospel. That will be left to his followers who know him true by faith and will share him. The house cleansed, probably many people now going home. But now it's late and everyone is exhausted. The disciples fall asleep. I'm sure Jesus probably takes a few hours of rest as well. But then before dawn, having served in compassion, And knowing what is next in his ministry, he now will commune with his father. He gets up, goes to a desolate place, that place where he'll encounter his father. He'll pray to him, he'll speak with him. What was the content of their conversation? I don't know what it was. I know what it wasn't. There was no need of Jesus to go to his father seeking forgiveness of sin. He doesn't have any. There was no need for him to say, have mercy on me. Because there was no condemnation for him, not in himself. But does he speak to his father about those next steps in ministry? Does he consult his father on his father's wisdom as to whether or not it's time to leave Capernaum or not? Does he simply commune with his father to be reminded of his father's unfailing love for him, being totally human and yet totally God? Perhaps all of that. He spends time with his father who is the heart of grace. And now as he communes with his father, now Peter, the other disciples, they all wake up. They realize Jesus is gone. There are people probably, they probably woke up because people were already showing up at the door again. Hey, we we brought some more sick. Is Jesus here? We brought some more people in need. You see, the ones that had the touch of Christ's grace in their life, they went out and found others and brought them. Well, no, he's not here. We got to go find him. And his disciples, they probably had a good guess. You know what? There are times like this. He goes out to a desolate place and he prays. Let's go find him. When they go and find him, Peter says, hey, everyone's looking for you. You know, everyone, everyone that wants that thing that you've given, you know, I mean, that kind of made us popular in my house. There's another crowd back there. Let's go back and be popular. And Jesus says, No. Let's move on to the next towns, the next villages. Why? So that I can proclaim the word. So that Jesus' ministry will not be hallmarked so much that he is a healer as he is the proclaimer and the fulfiller of God's word. Because you see, that's why he's came. Why? Because in that word, God delivers that promise of salvation. In that word made flesh, he will fulfill that promise of salvation as that word will hang on a cross for our salvation. You see, that's why Jesus has come out. Come out of where? Come out of Peter's house? Come out of Capernaum? Come out of heaven and come down to earth? The answer is probably yes, all of it. That's why he's up early that day. I'm going to talk to my father, then we're going to move on because my mission is to proclaim the word of God. Because then people will hear of his forgiving grace. And then they'll see it fulfilled in me. And so they move on. They move on and Jesus continues to preach throughout Galilee. And notice that with that comes that sign, those that occupy forces of evil, they are getting kicked out. 
Why? Because God's salvation has arrived. It's Jesus. Now we slowed it down. We drew a little more out of the text, but we still might say, but what's the application for us today? What is it that the modern followers of Jesus have from this? What do we glean? What do we gain from it? Besides the fact that there might have been more than just a bunch of random events thrown together. And this week in my preparation for this message, I kept circling back to that line from Peter, everyone is looking for you. And it got me to wondering, is everyone still looking for Jesus today? Yeah, I mean, I, I know world out there, they're looking for something. Our world out there, I think our world out there is looking for an answer to the loneliness that they've experienced over this past year. I think the world is looking for a hope, a hope for healing, a hope for life and protection. I think the world in many places is looking for that. I think the world is looking maybe for a sense of purpose about what the meaning of life is still. I think many in the world are still looking for an encouragement. I think they're looking for a place of belonging. I think there are many, if not all in the world, are still in one fashion or another looking for love. But are they looking for Jesus in all of that? The pastor shaking his head no. And I would agree. But the thing that breaks my heart at times is maybe that the world is not looking for Jesus because when they look at his followers, they wonder if Jesus would have anything of that to offer. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but, but about me, at my weakest points, at my worst points, sometimes I'm not that one that's all filled with joy, but it's a little bit more mundane, a little bit more glum. Sometimes as a follower who represents Jesus in this world, I might not be all that joyful. I might not be all that compassionate when there are people in need. I might think to myself, let others take care of them. I'm exhausted. When there are people out there that are seeking an answer for loneliness, I'm the one sometimes that would say, "Ah, I can't talk to strangers. And I certainly can't talk to them about my faith. Man, that might seem weird to them. And then, and then like what? Then a stranger might not, what? Might not appreciate me as if I really need another stranger appreciating me? When folks aren't looking for Jesus in the world today and they're looking at me and saying, well, what, what does Jesus have to offer? Maybe because I'm just not all that merciful at times or not all that forgiving. Maybe it's because I'm not, I don't have the same sense of urgency that Paul does at times where he'd say, I'd become all things to all people if but by a chance to win and then save a few of them. Maybe you're that way too. May our Savior call us to repentance. And may he give us his forgiving grace when as his representatives, we don't look all that much like him so that the world, when they look at us, would say, we got to go find answers somewhere else for our deepest needs. But as he gives us that forgiving grace, may he then draw us a little deeper, a little closer to the heart in following the rhythm of ministry that our Lord sets out for us in the gospel reading today. So that we might be a little bit more mindful of the times when we encounter someone who's in need of a compassionate touch, like Peter's mother-in-law or the sick and the demon-possessed that were at Peter's house that day. That we might look at those in need and say, you know what, God's equipped me to be his agent of compassion in their lives. For what purpose? That I might touch them with God's love. And as they receive his love, they might draw a little bit closer to wondering who he is. Maybe they'll even bring another friend or a neighbor in need. And may I continue to be resourced to meet those needs. And as I'm engaged in, in sharing that compassionate love, just the way my Savior did may also then be drawn to those places where I get to commune with God, where I get to speak to him and just as importantly, hear him speak to me, where he'll remind me of his unfailing love for me, where he'll remind me of that hope and healing that is mine in in my Savior's cross and empty tomb, 
where he'll be merciful and forgiving and compassionate to me. Because as I'm renewed in that communion with God, then may his church have that same heart of saying, now where's the new place? Where's the next place? Where's that next opportunity that we get to speak the word of God, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, where we can find that new place to reach out to that new person? Why? Because that's why we've come out, out of this building, out of our homes, where we've come out from eternity, because that's where we are with our Savior, to come to this time and place to proclaim his news. Probably the answer is yes, all of it. And even if the details of all of that might seem just like a bunch of random, unrelated events thrown together to move the plot along, may we know that our Lord has placed us here for that reason, to share his good news, even as we receive it, that salvation might be known in no one else than Christ Jesus our Lord. More than random events, those items used by him to share life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen.